we go. Coming to you live. Uh, let me, you know what? Let me start this all over again. Let me start this all over again. Here we go. It didn't work. Let me try this. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, good to be here. Coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. Only wishing that we were coming to you from what a happy time in heaven. I just... I just like that kind of music. I think that's. I think it's okay for you to get happy in the Lord every now and then. I, I do. There, there's so much crud going on in the world right now. It's awful what's going on in this world. And I think it's okay to sing a joyful song and get happy about one of these days we're going to go to heaven, even if everything doesn't turn out right. And I've got something on my mind right now. Um, somebody asked me. It was Jill who is always a pill, um, asked me a question about what would I, what would it take or what, uh, let me, let me read the question. Let me, I don't want to get it wrong. Let me pull it up here. I don't like to quote somebody and, uh, let's see here. I don't know. I don't, I can't find it now. Anyway, she, uh, she, um, no, here it is. Hang on here. Jill, 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 yeah. Nope, can't find it, can't find it. Anyway, she asked me about uh, what would it take, what would I suggest it would take to get somebody who does not want to read the King James Bible, what would it take to get them to read the King James Bible? And that's, to me, that's simple. It's the King James Bible. Um we we try and and rightfully so i mean there's nothing wrong with this we try these arguments these logical arguments we try to lay out evidence we try to show people hey here's a good vine here's a bad vine we all these things but i'm convinced that the best way to get people turned on to the king james bible is just quote it quote it talk about it live it let it let them see it working in your life um and let me tell you what i what i mean by that um, here's what happened with me. I was sitting in my office one day and I was just musing. I was thinking, I was meditating on a thought process that God was putting through my mind. And this is the benefit of having times where you can, where you can be still. And I'm not talking about contemplative prayer. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm just saying that there's a benefit to to turning everything off in the world and just contemplating and meditating in the scriptural fashion on God and on passages of scripture and, and the Holy Ghost then leads you into those thoughts. And um, it was a thought process that led me to the King James is the word of God. And I just accepted it. I mean, I didn't go, oh, come on. I mean, I didn't do that. I just boom it was like that it was done and let me let me give you a scripture that backs that up and i want to show you this and th this is from the beginning in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void um and if you want to believe in a gap theory then you go to the original hebrew and where it says the word was you change that to became because you can change the bible if you want everybody knows that but no, it says was, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. That's how simple this is. If I can, if I through my preaching or my teaching can logically or emotionally or whatever coerce or convince somebody that something is true, then somebody can come right behind me and convince the same person that it's not true. And that's what's happening. That's, that happens every day. And I'll say this likewise. For those who, let's say that they've been taught by some blogger on the web, some false doctrine, Somebody else can come behind them and teach them another one. Did you know Bradley in our church started out being a Jehovah's Witness before the Mormon guys got to him and converted him to a Mormon? A lot of people don't know that. 
But at one time, him and Brady were twin J-dubs. And Bradley said, no, that's a false doctrine. I'm going to go for the truth. Joseph Smith. Aww. And that's what he did. But it wasn't until the truth of the word of God came into both of their hearts that they finally surrendered to it. And they get it now. You listen to these guys preach. They get it. They understand it. Because God said to them, let there be light. By the way, this is the creation process. And this is also the process of God creating in someone a clean heart. Remember what David said, Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And that's the pro God uses this process. I've, te I've taught on this before. Maybe I need to teach on this again. It's a beautiful, beautiful lesson. If you look at the creation week, you can see how a lost man comes to Jesus Christ. Um, God turns the light on in their soul. And it's interesting that there's no real known source for this light. There's just light everywhere. It's not until day four where the Gospels are, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that that man understands the source of that light. It, it, it's just a beautiful, beautiful teaching here. But here's what I'm recommending to everybody. Um, if you're finding that, you're can't, that you can't win people over to the Word of God or to the things that we know to be true, if you find that you can't win them over using logical explanations or experiences or emotionals uh, or anything like that, and, I mean, I use that stuff. That's just part of, that's just part of the nature of Mike Hoggard. If we find that we can't convince people with those things, why don't we just try giving them the word of God? Because I have this idea that at some point, people are going to be sickened, they're going to be tired, they're going to be empty of all the false, vain Bible versions, all the false, vain doctrines, and everything floating around out there, I have this feeling that people are going to just be starving for the truth and the truth of the Word of God. Um, this is what we have found at this ministry. We have found people that were wandering stars, and they had tried this, they had sampled that, they had done this, and it all left them bankrupt. And then... All of a sudden, and I have, I hear this every week. I don't know how I found you on the internet, but I did. And they're referring to our videos and things like that. And they say, we're done searching. We, we found the truth and it's in the word of God, the King James Bible. And I just want to encourage you with that. Just give people the word of God. You know, I had an idea the other day. Um, you can do this or not. People ask me, you know, how can I help? How can I help? What can I do? Um, Brother Reg Kelly has had for years, and I believe it's still going on, a, uh, what he calls a truck stop ministry. Back years ago, a few years ago, they were making cassette tapes. He had people in different places uh, that were buying duplicators and were buying the cassettes, and they were duplicating his messages on cassette, and they had set up in different truck stops um, because truckers go in there, and they were giving these cassette tapes away for free. And he would hear from truckers all over the country writing him letters saying, thank you, I got saved. Thank you for preaching this way. And uh, now they've since converted to CD. And um, I, I just might submit to you if you're looking for something to do and, and you're looking to just promote, if, if you're wanting to plant a seed in someone's heart, if you notice, not every time that I open my mouth do I say, it's the King James only. you got to believe that, King James only. I don't do that. A lot of times what I'm going to do is I'm just going to send the word out in whatever teaching that I'm giving. I'm just sending Bible verses out. And that's something that people have noticed that is different about our ministry. It says it's just loaded with Bible verses. And you, you duplicate these DVDs or you can ask us to do it for you. I don't think Gary has near enough to do. Um, and we'll send you whatever you want and go to go to truck stops go to local gas stations and say and make a little make a little display make it not doesn't have to be in everybody's way but just say can we can we set this up in um i don't know so i'm getting a call hang on a second oh no never mind it went away can we set this up in this place here and and just let it go 
and you know you, try it and see what happens and then because a lot of truckers now they're looking they're on the road they usually have a tv and a dvd player in the cab of their truck they're looking for something to watch you give them some interesting titles there they're going to watch it you just never know the seed that you're going to plant the people that you're going to reach the souls that could be in heaven waiting to meet you when you get there uh, just a little encouragement talking about the light um, Rashonda gets it um, I have um, I, I've learned some things on Facebook about how to open up my thing on Facebook I'm still new to this stuff and um, I found out only recently that not everybody could friend me on Facebook. well I think I fixed that now so I'm getting quite a few Facebook people uh, every week and this is a relatively new one here this is a young lady you know I don't know where she lives I think she's listening she probably mad at me because I don't remember where she lives Rashonda out of uh, probably a thousand Facebook friends I don't really keep up with where everybody lives so forgive me because I told her I was gonna read this she sent this to me uh, yesterday I think she listened to the live broadcast on Tuesday and she heard me talk about Obama and and Mitt Romney and um, so anyway, yeah, that phone call, now Alicia's texting me. She said it was scary Gary down there. After me saying he doesn't have enough, enough to do, he was calling up here to say, what? Because I've given him the responsibility of making, we are going to do this. We're making 15,000 DVDs to make and give out at the um, uh, Future Congress in uh, Dallas, Texas in January. Um and I don't do this very much at all, but this is a big undertaking. It, it's going to cost us a little bit. If you would like to help us out with that and pitch in a little bit, uh, we would appreciate it. All right. Uh, somebody's got to buy Gary Taco Bell. Just If you just buy him a little snack or something like that, he'll just keep going and going and going. Anyway, uh, Rashonda. Um, and I, I went, I went, Rashonda, I went to your Facebook page. Hope, hope you don't think I was like creeping up on you or something. Um, but every now and then people that, that, that friend me, I like to kind of find out who they are by what they post. And I've had to unfriend some people because, um, they would write on my wall. I, I, maybe that's what you're supposed to do on Facebook, but I think that's rude to write a, a message of yours on somebody else's wall. It's like me going up to your yard and put, putting political signs in your yard without your permission. I just kind of think that's rude. Uh, anyway, so um, she is a Bible believer. She loves the Lord, and she sent me a note. She listened to the broadcast on Tuesday. She sent me a note, and she has, I told her, I said, can I, can I read what you said online and not give your name? She said, give my name. I like this. Rashonda said, I listened to the show today and wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Pastor Mike, for staying true to the word of God and not doctrines of man. I'm starting to see more and more Christians say they are not voting for either Obama or Romney as they both believe in antichrist doctrine. Please note there are many black people being bullied. Rashonda is black, okay? Um, she says there are many black people being bullied and guilted by other black people to vote for Obama. As a black woman, you would not believe all the so-called black quote unquote Christians that are blindly voting for Obama because he is black and nothing else. I posted on my Facebook page that since I am a Bible believing Christian, filtering everything through the lens of scripture, I am not voting for either Obama or Romney. It was so interesting to see the response of my black Facebook friends. Immediately, they were like, you should vote because our ancestors died so we could have this right and it would be a slap in their faces not to vote. Now, what I tried to do there was tried to add a, a sense of a attitudinal black woman, you know, with the head and the, and I just, I can't pull it off. So forgive me. Um, 
since I regularly read my Facebook posts, all these friends that were complaining were definitely going to vote for Obama. It's like it's this big no-no in the black community not to vote for Obama. It, and I'm going to stop. It. It's, it's almost like, Rashani, you're coming out of the closet, aren't you? I, I preached a message uh, several years ago, and it really, it really, the message changed me. And it was called Christianity Out of the Closet. And I was just studying the book of Acts about all these people that just stood up for what they believed in, and they died. They got persecuted, and I'm going, let's do it. We ain't got nothing else to do. We've already had all the fun in life. Let's go get killed for standing up for Jesus. Amen? So anyway, she's coming out of the closet. She said, one friend just outright said, you need to vote for Obama and try to use the Bible to back up her claim. Instantly, I corrected her use of taking the Bible out of context and backed up what I was saying with Scripture. Basically, I backed up what I was saying with the Scripture, the whole post, and even though my Facebook friends tried to reason with me using New Age doctrine and man logic, I stood strong and told them I would not go against my God for no one. Right arm. See, that's my right arm. I will always obey the law of the, of the land, but when the law conflicts with the word of God, I will always follow God's word first. High five, Roshanda. High five. Period. I guess I will be kicked out of the black community and labeled a traitor. Oh, well, I can live with that, but I will never use my skin color as an excuse to please no man. Black, white, or purple I didn't know there were any purple people Rashonda I know that there's a flying purple people eater but I don't know that there's any purple people thank you I love you God bless and you know what when they kick you out of their of their crowd Rashonda you just come join us all right and what you already are anyway um, Listen, they're going to kick you out of the black communities, the white communities, the, um, the emergent church communities, the NIV communities. They're going to kick you out of the denominations. They're going to kick you. You will be hated and despised and rejected for the name of Jesus Christ and for the word of God. And you know what? Uh, I read in the Revelation, in the book of Revelation, that they love not their lives even unto death. They were beheaded. What were they beheaded for? The word of God and their testimony. That's what they were beheaded for. And I want to tell you something. You ain't doing it right if, if you ain't got a bunch of wicked people hating your guts. And I'm not saying you got to go out and make everybody mad. I think that's rude. But I'm saying if you stand on issues and you go against the crowd, you go against the tradition, you go against the family line, hey, you got to go with the family. You go against that stuff, they're going to come out after you. They're going to hate your guts. You're not going to get invited to the parties. You're not going to get to ask to lead in prayer. You're not going to get any of that stuff. They will, in fact, I've got, Rashonda, I've got people lined up behind this ministry because their pastor and their elders asked them to leave their church. Why? The King James Bible. They asked them to leave over the King James Bible. They said, you're not welcome here anymore. Get out. Oh, sister, I love you in the Lord. Um, I've got a video clip. Um, this is a black preacher who a uh, couple interesting things are happening with this guy. Number one, he got arrested here, I don't know, six months ago, something like that. His daughter turned him in. I don't know what was going on there. But then uh, just recently, just yesterday, I think, uh, his church, World Changers, something, another harvest, agape, love feast, praise tabernacle or something like that, uh, there was a guy got killed. One of his teachers was teaching some kind of Bible study, and a former employee of the church walked in, shot him dead, blew him, blew him away. Um, so, but they, the, the article was quick to point out that Reverend Dollar, see, that just doesn't, it just doesn't sound right. Reverend Dollar um, was not injured in the melee. Um, somebody sent me this. It's an online clip. It's on YouTube. You can find it if you want to. I'd find it and post it on my Facebook and do whatever you, wherever, wherever you are on the internet, I would put this dude up. All right. This is Creflo the dollar. 
Uh, and, you know, it, it, I'm Kenya. If, if I was him, I would get a different last name. I would use, like, my middle name or something like that. I would be like Michael Wayne. If I was Michael Dollar, I would be Michael Wayne. Now you know my middle name. I would be. Um, the Bible specifically, speci and I just read this the other day, specifically deals with the idea of these false prophets that here's, here's what gets them. Um, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil. That means they'll hate the King James Bible. Did you get that? They'll hate the King James Bible. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. And so here is Creflo the dollar preaching. I mean, it comes out of his mouth that tithing leads to salvation. That's what he said. You tithe, if you're lost, you're unsaved, you start tithing. And when you start paying the bills, God will save you. I'm not making this up. You listen to what this guy said. You can't, you can't be in bondage to people and expect to hear from God. And if you'll obey God, he'll tell you what to do. He'll tell you what to do. Somebody says, I'm having a hard time. Are you tired? No. All right, tired. Tired. Quit fussing with it and tired. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You know what? I know people who are not even born again. There's some people in this church, there may be a few people here tonight, that were not even born again, but they tied unsaved. And do you know that tithe was so strong, it hooked them to the blessing? And they later on got born again? Well, that's what the tithe does. The tithe hooks you to the blessing. It takes care of the situation that you're dealing with. Then you, you shouting over what God did, but then it ain't finished yet. You, if, if you tithe, you are not, the, the curse, you can't stay cursed tithing. That's why every sinner I know who tithe end up saved. No. No, that's not, that's not right. See, this is where we have taken the men and put them up here and said, whatever the man says, he's the man of God. And whatever the man says, why, well, it must be true. He's telling you that tithing, listen to, listen to this guy, listen to what he said. He just said that tithing breaks the curse on you. So this is... This is, number one, it's a works salvation. If you perform this, then you can have eternal life. That's what he just said. He just said, he just contradicted the Bible that said, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And he's getting you to boast on tithe. Well, bless God, I wasn't saved. I, I started tithing and God saved me because I started tithing. It's, listen, you don't listen to that stuff. And there are scores and hundreds and thousands of false teachers all over this country, all over this world, that are preaching the same kind of gospel, that if you perform, God blesses. Oh, that's how it was in the Old Testament. That was the old contract, the old covenant. If you perform, God will bless. Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Well, that counts me out. I've done all three of those. I have no right to be blessed whatsoever. By the way, Rashonda, uh, I told her I was going to read that today. She said, thank you, Pastor Mike. Be blessed. And I said, I am already in Christ. How did I get that way? I didn't perform. I, listen, I guarantee you. I guarantee you. You ought to listen to me. I don't perform. I don't. God blesses anyway in Christ. How? I believe. I believe this book. I believe that there's a man up there. I don't care if his name is dollar, cash, money. I don't care what his name is. If he stands there and says that if I start tithing, then I'm going to get saved. God's going to break all my curses and save me. That is, listen, Christ died in vain if you can pay money and get out of heaven. 
the the mother harlot has birthed a daughter harlot. Go read Ezekiel 16. The mother harlot, Roman Catholicism, the massive repository of mystery doctrines and false gospels, has been doing this for 16, 17, 1800 years, 1700 years, something like that, of telling everybody if you pay the money, we can get you out of limbo. If you pay the money to get the mass said, you're in. Why do you think all these gangsters, why do you think all these Italian gangsters, mafia, why do you think they're Roman Catholic? Because they can do whatever they want to. They can shoot and kill and sell drugs and sell women and sell everything else in the world, shake people down for money, do all of these things, go to the priest, pay the Catholic Church a, a sum of money, and they get a get out of hell free card with it. This is why they're all Catholic. Even in St. Louis, I, there is, I know of a situation right now in St. Louis. By the way, wh where is, I got, a UF, I got some UFO stuff to give you. And one that happened around here, but I know of a situation right now in the St. Louis area where there is a, um, a corporate attorney involved with the St. Louis Mafia. The St. Louis Mafia is tied in with the Archdiocese of St. Louis and a particular Catholic priest is tied in with the Mafia and has had numerous affairs with several people linked in with this situation. I know all this stuff. It's going on. Speaking of San Luis, there is, there was uh, yesterday or the day before in Illinois, again, um, there was a UFO sighting. It was, I don't, I, you know, I didn't have time to, to get the, the film of it. But they talked about it on the local news. Scott Air Force Base says, which is the Air Force Base just on the other side of the Mississippi River. Um, they said, we don't, know, we don't know anything about it. We did, it wasn't us. And that's what the Air Force is supposed to say. Um, but that just happened. Um, about 15 years ago, something like that, there was the, an episode called the Illinois Lights. There was, and uh, I think History Channel or somebody did a documentary on this thing. It was on cable a few years ago. Um, there was a there was a UFO that had been spotted over Illinois. A police officer had chased it for I don't know how many miles. One of these triangular shaped, kind of reminded me of the Phoenix Lights. And um, nobody knows what it was. It moved through the air. It didn't ever made a sound. Disappeared. Moved. I mean, just did all these weird things. Then. Um, Ron sent me a photo. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Let me read. Uh, he said, I saw these lights in Nashville, 27th of September, 2012, around 10.30 p.m. I thought they were fireworks at first and realized they were not. They look like insects coming up out of an underground hive. I want you to think about that. That is, Ron, that is interesting. They look like insects coming up out of an underground hive, then moving across the sky in the same general direction. Some move faster than others as if to catch up with another one, and then moved on until they all disappeared into the sky. I use the building as a frame of reference. I have two others, but they are just of the lights alone. And uh, this is for, he actually gave me his, uh, his last name and his uh, phone number. And, uh, Ron, I will not give your phone number out over the air. Um, but I, I, I like the, what he said was they look like insects coming up out of an underground hive. That, to me, is interesting. And then there is, and all this is just happening recently. Here's something. Uh, let me pull the, the story up here. This happened over, where is it? That's the... Kentucky I don't I don't see it anywhere I had it pulled up I think this just happened um, here, yeah here it is cylindrical UFO videotape by Kentucky amateur astronomer Alan Epling several eyewitnesses in different areas of eastern Kentucky reported seeing a strange cylindrical UFO hover for two hours in clear skies last week but an amateur astronomer striking video and images of the object are now coming to light 
Um, he said it was just a very bright daylight star that was getting brighter, then getting dimmer, then getting brighter again. According to CBS affiliate WYMT-TV, Epling, pictured at the right, said the object looked like two fluorescent bulbs side by side, parallel, shining very brightly. It would get so bright that they would seem to merge and you could see it very clearly with the naked eye. Then it would dim down almost invisible. There is a YouTube video of this. If you want to go to YouTube and type in UFO sighted over Virgie, V-I-R-G-I-E, Kentucky, on October the 16th, 2012. Um, you have uh, you have you have seen or maybe you have seen uh, my video UFO chariots of the beast. It, to me, it's interesting. I keep going back to this thing. They they look like insects coming up out of an underground hive, then moving across the sky in the same general direction. That's inter that idea of of insects is very interesting. Let's do this. Let's open up our can in Revelation chapter nine. Very, very interesting place in the Bible because uh, I have a picture of these things. Actually, it's not an actual photograph. It is a sculptor's rendition. This has been sitting in the Louvre for years, and uh, somebody sent it, reminded me of it, and I'll tell the story in a minute. But Revelation chapter 9, he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose the smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Locusts are insects. It's what they are. Um, scorpions are, I don't know, I don't know how to characterize scorpions. But these things... Um, and we've been covering this in our Bible study on the book of Revelation, what they looked like, how they appeared. Uh, the, who was it, Hal Lindsey said, uh, these are Apache attack helicopters. That's what they are. The Apostle John didn't quite know what he was looking at back in 2,000 years ago in AD 93. But I clearly believe these are Apache attack helicopters with the pilot's face being seen through the glass. That's, that's Hal Lindsey. If you've ever listened to Hal Lindsey, he talks just like that. Um, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. They had hair as the hair of women. I wonder if it was in ponytails or one of those big tease bob jobs sticking up on their head. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as the breastplates of iron. There's your connection with the iron kingdom. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And I started this Wednesday. I'm going to continue it next Wednesday, uh, dealing with this and the linkage between these and these chariots. That's what these things, I, I believe the Bible is telling you what these are. I don't think there's a mystery out there the Bible does not address. And I think the Bible is telling you that these UFOs are chariots. Their lights, their spirit realm, fourth dimensional things. This is why they can move like they do and then disappear and nobody has an explanation for it. Does that sound weird? Yeah, but we live in a weird world. We're going to have to get used to seeing some weird stuff. And if we're not grounded biblically on what's going on, we're going to fall for the lie. We're going to, as some have suggested, that there's going to be an introduction of alien life form or evidence that we've been visited by another planet and it's going to wipe out all the religious ideas of the world and and you know what i'm going i don't think that's so far-fetched but whatever is going to happen we need to be grounded in the word and say you know what i think the bible is teaching me what this is so that when it happens i'll go you know what i'm not falling like everybody else is falling i'm not going to do that um, years ago, I, wa uh, I don't, I do not, people please, do not attempt this at home. It's dangerous. I watched, and they had to edit it for TV. I watched The Exorcist when I was a kid. They edited it for TV. And I have never seen anything like this in my life. And I'm going, oh. And then they had um, the follow-up, Exorcist II, The Heretic. 
And I remember watching that one, and I'm going, oh, this is not as good as the first one. Um, and I was, I can't remember how old I was when it, I think the movie came out in 79, Exodus 2, Exorcist 2, The Heretic. And I probably saw it a few years after that when it came on television. You know, that's how we watched movies back then. We didn't go to the theater. We had to wait for it to show up on CBS, all right? So it finally comes on TV, and I watch it. And I, I remember them talking about locusts and going to Africa and all this stuff. And I'm going, what has that got to do with anything? I didn't really understand. And I remember hearing an, a word that one of these, this devil that was in this girl named Reagan, that's interesting, um, she was possessed with this devil, and this devil gave its name. And I, I had heard it wrong. I thought it said Bazuzu, and I'm going, that's made up. They made that name up. Oh, come on. They could have come up with something different, you know, something better than that. Um, and it just, and it just, it's one of those things that just sat in the little file cabinet, overstuffed file cabinet in my brain. And then a guy sends me a, an email and he says, Pastor Mike, take a look at this. And I went, mm -hmm -hmm. oh my goodness, look at that. I got to find the email now. Um, I don't know if I have it printed out. I have the, uh, here it is. He said, hi, Pastor Mike, have you ever heard of Pazuzu? And I went, Puzz. oh, that's what it was. This is from uh, Kathleen. I kept calling Kathleen a he, didn't I? Pastor Mike, have you ever heard of Pazuzu? He was the Babylonian king of the demons of the wind. He has the body of a man, the head of a lion, two pairs of wings, talon feet, and a scorpion tail. Oh. Um, and in the movie, The Exorcist, The Heretic, Pazuzu is the king of the locusts, and he commands the locusts. And I'm going, uh, it's clicking. I get it now. I understand. And uh, here is here is the, the graphic. And I'm going to get the, uh, I got the Wikipedia article out on this Pazuzu. And here's my thing with this. I think people before us were very well aware of who these gods, who these devils were. Here is, now, I mean, what does that look like to you? Do we not see a little Baphomet here? And the article in um, Wikipedia says uh, Pazuzu is often depicted as a combination of diverse animal and human parts. Well, that's interesting. He has the body of a man, the head of a lion or a dog, eagle-like talon feet, two pairs of wings, a scorpion's tail, and a serpentine you-know-what thingy. He is often depicted with his right hand pointing upward and left hand pointing down. Wow! Isn't that interesting? Pazuzu is the demon of the southwest wind known for bringing famine during dry seasons and locusts during rainy seasons. Pazuzu was said to be invoked in amulets which combat the powers of his rival, the malicious god Lamashtu, or the malicious goddess Lamashtu, who was uh, believed to cause harm to mother and child during childbirth. Although Pazuzu is himself an evil spirit, he drives away other evil spirits, therefore protecting humans against plagues and misfortune. Now, isn't that a nice little setup? Isn't that an interesting little setup? He's bad, but he can be good because he drives away other evil spirits. So in, in that way, he's good. We, he can drive away all these bad things that are happening. I, uh, I, I smell a setup here. But to me, to me, this is just, this is beyond fascinating. Here the Bible is telling you the truth. It's trying to tell you what these creatures looked like. And all of these scholars for hundreds of years have been going, uh, the, the wings, they represent um, uh, swiftness. And let's see, the teeth of the lion, they represent um, bad breath. 
And the scorpion's tail represents something that would crawl in your bed at night. You know, they come up with all this stuff that is not found anywhere in the Bible to try to explain and say that, now, this is not really real. This is a metaphor. This is a simile. This is a, an idiom. This is, um, this is a figure of speech is what this is. This is not really, that nobody expects that these things will really come to light. Well, apparently they did because here we have people carving images of exactly what the Bible says they are. And I'm just going, that's just okay. I mean, it's like, it's like you have a photograph of these devils coming out of the bottomless pit. This is what they look. I've been trying to tell people for a long time. Don't worry about what you think the Bible means. Look at what it says. It says that they had scorpion's tails. It says they were locusts. It says that they had the faces of men. It said that they had wings. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, you know what? It just looks like to me that the Bible was right to begin with. Give people the word of God. Give them the Bible and let God deal with them through the word of God. And let me, here's, and some of you know me. I get kind of perturbed driving by churches that spend thousands of dollars, literally, they spend thousands of dollars putting up these nice signs in front of their church. First church is so-and-so, this such-and-such -such church. And then they, they either, um, now they're doing electronically with these light-up sign boards, which to me, the, all it does is cheapen your church into like a Vegas casino. But they put these letter boards under the church. And I don't have a problem with the letter boards because I think a church should have a message. And I'm going to ask you a question. How many churches have you driven by with these letter boards out there where they actually quoted scripture? Now, they might have some nice saying out there. They'll put like the word, the letter CH and then CH. And then they'll say, what's missing? Question mark. You are. And that's supposed to provoke me to coming to their church. I just think that the best way to reach people is give them Bible verses. Because I know for a fact that if the Holy Ghost is going to deal with somebody, he's going to deal with them through the written, spoken word of God. That's what I think. I, I, and I think the Bible bears that out. So why don't churches put Bible verses up on their thousand dollar letter boards. Why don't they do that? Um, I think part of it is the mind frame of most preachers nowadays, and you hear them say this, they'll say, well, people don't really understand the Bible. They just, if we put it out there, they would not understand that. And so we say something else that they can understand. And they put it out there as, as truth, as truth. And I'm reading some of these things, and I'm going, you know what? I don't think that's true. I think it can be proven wrong. Why don't we put Bible? Anyway, that's just my, that's my thing. What else is going on in the world today? We dealt with Pazuzu. You want to do a study on hell? I think it would be a good study. Here is Mike Tyson. Can I do a Mike Tyson voice? What would Mike Tyson say? How can I do a Mike Tyson voice? You know, I used to be a boxer. Is that a Mike Tyson voice? But now I'm a public speaker. Um, and here's why I brought this up. Where is it? Maybe I'm missing a page. The, the headline of this particular website, a guy sent me, Mike Tyson's Day of the Champions. Unleash the spirit of the champion within you. And it's going to be in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth uh, in the month of November. So Mike Tyson, the Muslim, the jailbird Muslim, is going to be a motivational speaker now. And he's going to tell you, I, I, to me, it's, it would be funny 
if it wasn't so dangerous. I mean, this idea of the unleashing the champion, the spirit of the champion in you. I know what that is. I know who that champion is. It's not Jesus either. He's not leashed. It's the spirit of Antichrist. But here is the jailbird Muslim Mike Tyson, who's going to be a, I don't know why they would pick this guy to be a motivational speaker anyway. But he's going to show you how to become the greatest champion of all time. Hopefully he'll have some pointers on how to avoid jail time. What else did I have pulled up in the queue today? Um, I'm going to read some emails here in a little bit to see I did the cherry. Ah, here we go. Oregon scientists make embryos with two women and one man. That's sick. Scientists in Oregon have created embryos with genes from one man and two women using a provocative technique that could someday be used. And here, and listen to this now, because this is all good. This is good for us. This is going to save the babies. Someday would be used to prevent babies from inheriting certain rare incurable diseases. The researchers at Oregon Health and Sciences University said they are not using the embryos to produce children. Wait, wait a minute. An embryo is a children. That's what it is. They already did. They just killed it then. They're not using the embryos to produce children. It is not clear when or even if this technique will be put. If this technique will ever be put to use. It probably will never, probably, even though down in California, they've already had legislative meetings on what kind of law should be passed when the inevitability of multi-parented human beings comes in. We need to have a law ready to deal with that. Talk about a paradigm shift. But it has already stirred a debate over its risk and ethics in Britain where scientists did similar work a few years ago. You Brits, you always send your bad stuff over here. The Beatles, Elton John, the stones keep Brit you Brits keep all your bad stuff over there just just keep it you can send Mr. Bean I think Mr. Bean's funny okay but you can keep everything else the British experiments reported in 08 led to headlines about the possibility someday of babies with three parents think about think about babies with three parents that's a parent time shift that's what it is um oh you know what i'll do this too this this this, this kind of makes sense okay the son of satan he would be th th this i don't know this is kind of interesting to me he, the son of satan was by the way, this this is interesting that he's a preacher by day, but he's the son of Satan by night. <laughs> That's what he is. So I used to read this garbage. And um, his mother is a human woman. Of course, his father is Satan. So he has for his his mother has the DNA from her parents, which she passed on to him. And then the seed of the serpent. Genesis chapter 3. Um, anyway, the British government is asking for public comment on the technology before it decides whether to allow its use in the future. Sure, sure, sure. One concern it cites is whether such DNA alteration could be an early step down a slippery slope toward designer babies ordering up, say, a petite blue-eyed girl or tall, dark-haired, six-fingered boy. Now, I didn't really say that, but that's what they're getting at. And then the sheriff of Nottingham would be very proud of this one. The Nottingham Blue Coat School and Technology College. 
is doing a, let's see, cashless, cashless catering system. The Nottingham Blue Coat School and Technology College is, is designing, let me get this where I can see my screen here, is designing a new way the future is in your hands, 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 hands. And it's come up with, um, here's how it works. When the child places his or her finger on the scanner, the software matches their fingerprint with the unique digital signature held in the database. And apparently, it's just kind of like the thing that we saw with the, the girl putting her hand down on the thing to buy her lunch. Same technology. It's all over the world. Why is that? There's something going on here. Let's do just, um, oh, here's something else here. Suit eyed over yoga in public schools. Parents in Southern California community are considering legal action over the constitutionality of a form of yoga being taught to their children, which they claim is introducing religion into public schools. It is. It's introducing religion into churches. Can you believe that? It's introducing false doctrine religions, Eastern mysticism, into churches, and churches are doing it. Oh, it's, it's just, it's not, it's yoga for Jesus. I'm praising Jesus. I'm saying Jesus over and over again, even though he said not to. Last month, half of the students attending classes in the Encinitas Union School District K-6 Elementary Schools in San Diego, North County, began taking Ashtanga, <laughs> Sanskrit for eight-limbed, which means eight arms. Why eight? If you watch the Watchmen video broadcast this Sunday, you'll find out why eight is important. Uh, began taking Ashtanga yoga for 30 minutes twice per week in January. The other half will begin the lessons. Concerned parents have now retained constitutional First Amendment attorney Dean Broyles, who says the Ashtanga yoga is a religious form of yoga and that religious aspects have been introduced into the schools. You see, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the Ashtangas. If the Christians can't bring their doctrine in by the teacher, then neither can the Eastern mystics either. But see, they don't play fair. Nobody does. Broyles said that he brought up the matter in the uh, school district trustees meeting along with 60 concerned parents. The trustees will be reviewing whether the grant money violates the religious freedom of students. I, I want to know. I want to find out who gave the grant money. Oh, it says here. The JOIS Foundation, Joie, Joyce, I don't know what that is. Foundation, a nonprofit that promotes Ashtanga yoga across the world. They, listen, they gave a $533,000 grant to this school. Half a million bucks to teach this stuff. These people are well-funded, and they're serious about what they're trying to promote. And it's not going to go away. They can bring all the lawsuits they want to, and it's not going to go away. Let's change for a minute. Let's do, um, there was something on Drudge Report that I, I thought was uh, interesting just briefly. Um, Barack Hussein. This is on Politico. Obama's, Obama says kids know Romney is dishonest, but here's what he said. President Obama sat for an interview with Rolling Stone for next in month's uh, issue, and Playbook was the first look at the story by Douglas Brinkley. Um, this is a quote. We arrived at the Oval Office for a 45-minute interview on the morning of October 11th. As we left the Oval Office, Executive Director Eric Bates told Obama that he had asked his six-year-old if there was anything she wanted him to say to the president. She said, tell him you can do it, Obama grinned. You know, kids have good instincts, Obama offered. They look at the other guy and say, well, that's a blanker, I can tell. And the blanker word is a reference to... Uh, what comes out of the end of a bull? That's what the president said to the kid. You know, kids are pretty smart. They can tell when the other guy's a... <coughs> Did I show you my graphic? Uh, caution now, this is very graphic, all right? <coughs> I made this, I sat in bed last night and made this and posted it on Facebook. Um, 
this is the two candidates sitting next to the God, the bishop, the archbishop. All three, and, and, and I wrote on there, all three of these men hate the word of God. Please tell me how you think America will be better off. And then I made another one. <clears throat> Same picture. Hey, have you heard this one? A Catholic, a Muslim, and a Mormon went into an evangelical church. You know, it's like a joke thing. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll move on. <clears throat> I'm going to read some emails here in a little bit. Um, but I got provoked to do a study on hell. Um, just what the Bible says about hell. I just believe, I just believe the Bible <clears throat> because one of the, one of the current, um, one of the current trends right now is to not use the word hell anymore. Um, where's my grammar? I got to put that back up there. There we go. The talk show hell hates. Um, and see, I could have gone to the original Greek. I could have said the talk show Gehenna hates. And just wouldn't have the same. I could say the talk show Tartarus hates. And it just wouldn't have the same. But a, a lot of people are going away from <clears throat> the King James English, going after these Greek words as if there's some different thing here. And I just had this idea that all of these different words, Sheol, Gehenna, um, Hades, Tartarus, I have the idea that they're all talking about the same place, just different aspects of it. They're describing different aspects of the same place. <clears throat> and so the New King James will even do this. It'll take the word hell out 22 times. It'll replace it with the word Hades or Sheol, but it won't, it won't tell you what that is. And you, I guess you're supposed to go because the word Hades is not in your English Bible. That will force you to go to, if you don't know what it is, it'll force you to go to a dictionary or an encyclopedia and say the ancient in Greek mythology, the, the place of Hades was where the, uh, the, the dead lived. And uh, it'll give you all this nonsense about, and, and it will not tell you the truth on hell. You can count on the word of God to tell you the truth on hell because God created it. He knows what it is, and he knows why he called different places of it by different names, and yet they're all categorized under the word hell. For instance, I'll just give you just a little, just this little teeny tiny little thing I know about this word Tartarus. It's only used one time in the New Testament. It's in Second um, Peter where it talks about, in the, in the King James, it says that he took those angels and put them in, in hell and he reserved them in chains under darkness. If you know what Tartarus is, you, you know that it basically is the lowest part of hell or that's what the definition of the word is. Well, it's telling you in the verse, reserve them in, in hell in chains under darkness. So it's telling you that it's the under part of that place. You don't need the Greek and the Hebrew, and you don't need to know what the ancient uh, Babylonians thought about that word. You don't need to know what Plato said about the about Tartar. You don't need to know that stuff. It will lead you astray. You just read the English, and it'll tell you all this stuff. And I, I have never, I've never said, I don't think you ought to look at the Greek and Hebrew. I don't, I, I've never said that. If you want to go look and, and look these words up, You'll find, I guarantee you'll find out that the English King James Bible matches perfectly what the Greek and Hebrews say. And all you got to, and if you, and if you don't, well, I don't think it does, then I would say go look up the English word because you only think you know what it means. That's not time yet. See, I knew I did something wrong. It's kind of catchy, but it's not the right tune. Anyway. So think about this idea of Tartarus, is, and it's only used one time, and it's translated hell. Rightfully so, because it is an area of hell, and it says that it's under darkness. And I'm going to show you the first occurrence of the word hell in the King James Bible. You're going you're to like this. It's in Deuteronomy 3222. You look this up. God said, for a fire is kindled in mine anger. Can I, can I chase a rabbit for a second? 
there's a new um, credit card. Um, it's from the people who, who would go, what's in your wallet? You remember that? And the, one of the first commercials they come out with, there was a serpent in a tree going, what's in your wallet? And I'm going, oh, I get that. I got it. <clears throat> the latest version of it, they're calling, <coughs> excuse me, I got something hung right here. Hang on. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> The latest commercial, the newest card that they have out is called the Spark card. And I'm going, I know what that is. It's the, the spark of divinity that's in you. It's the champion, the spark of divinity, the flame. And it needs to be kindled so that the full flame can arrive. And I know who that is. I know what, I know what spirit that is. Why did Amazon.com call their book reader a Kindle? For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto, here it is, the lowest hell. That's what, that's, the Bible's telling you that there is a lowest part of hell. It is under darkness so here is here is hell and 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 the bible describes it a place of outer darkness um i like to think like in the days when god put the plague of darkness upon egypt the bible says the darkness could be felt i have never been in darkness that thick but this darkness was so thick that it could be felt and i like to think that the the outer darkness of hell and I think the word outer represents a, another dimension, a, outside of the third dimensional realm. If you think hell is just like the geographic center of the earth because it's all molten lava and stuff like that, um, I think that's part of it, but I think it's beyond that. I think it is fourth dimension. Jesus said the heart of the earth. The heart of the earth. Well, my heart has four chambers in it, and I think that was part of what he was getting at. Uh, and, and Jesus went to that location after he died, not his spirit. Well, let me back that up, because I, I remembered talking about this on Tuesday that, um, who was it, Dave, Dave Hunt. Hello, this everybody. This is Dave Hunt. Um, and he talks like that, by the way. Dave Hunt is telling everybody that he believes that Jesus was, was slain in the spirit or killed in the spirit. Ah, 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 no way. Jesus went by the spirit to preach to those spirits in prison. Now the Bible's telling you that when, when God took the angels and he put them in hell, in chains, under darkness, then later in the other part of the scripture, we find out that it is prison. And if you look up the Greek word Tartarus, that's exactly the definition you're going to get. You're going to get the lowest part of hell, and it's a prison. And I'm going, it says that in the English is what it says. I think the Bible, just, just, read, just read the King James, okay? But here we have the lowest hell in the Bible's telling you that it has a very, 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 very low part. And it's under darkness it's under everything else and it's in that place that god put those angels in chains under darkness in prison and then he goes on to say and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains the mountains have foundations they are in the heart of the earth and god one of these days he's going to he's going to kindle a fire and I believe the earth is literally going to be consumed from the inside out. We know Peter said that the elements shall, be, shall melt with a fervent heat. This, I think, would then give way to the new heaven and the new earth. Here's the second occurrence of the word hell. See, all you got to do is study the word. Preach the word, study the word, believe the word. I believe the word. Hell. 
2 Samuel 22, 6, which is also mirrored uh, in Psalm 18, 5. This is uh, something that Samuel said. Or uh, was it Samuel? No, it was David. 2 Samuel 22, 6, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. So here we have death equated with hell in this same area. So we have, we have a lowest hell, and then we have death hell. Now, the Jehovah's Witness went around telling everybody, there, hell's not, it's only the grave. When you're buried down six feet under, 72 inches, that's interesting, by the way. That's all it is. And when you go to hell, you're, it's just you laying in the casket. That's, that's all it is. And I'm going, well, shoot. If that's all it is, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Who cares? But it's more than that. And I'll show you this as we move through our study. Um, Job 11.8 mentions it is, as, it is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? Job 26.6, hell is naked before him and destruction hath no covering. Notice how it puts hell and destruction together. By the way, the destroyer lives there right now. Hell and destruction. Hell is naked before him and destruction hath no covering. And so that place is destruction. All you got to do is read the scriptures and you get an accurate description of what God is teaching us about what's underneath our feet. Um, and then I'll leave you with this one and I'll read some email. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That is the crucial part right there. The wicked shall be turned into hell. Don't forget it. All the nations that forget God, they're going to be turned into hell for wickedness. So is the doctrine right that wicked people go to hell? There it is right there. There it is right there. This is why you need to be saved. This is why you need a savior. Email time. What was that show that, that was, uh, was it Blue Clues? We just got a letter. We just got a letter. So I'm going to read the letters. Uh, let's see here. Who's got Joe wrote in. Pastor Mike, my wife and I are ex-Catholics. Blood bought and blood washed. Amen. My wife, oh no, excuse, my, we thought my wife's brother had come out. You know what? Hang on a second. Joe, you better let me know if you want me to read this on the air, all right? I'm, go I'm just going to stop because I don't know. I have so many email addresses. I, I don't know. Sometimes maybe people might get messed up, all right? Anyway, uh, let's see here. What else? What else can we find here? Um, I sent myself some emails. Forrest. How you doing, Forrest? From Maui. He's a wowie from Maui. Aloha, Mike. Rub it in, why don't you? Recently, I've watched some YouTube videos about the spirit behind Hollywood deception and the music industry. After a couple minutes, I realized the presenter of the films are Seventh-day Adventists. They seem to have great discernment when it comes to exposing these subjects. I know all about Ellen G. White and her crazy visions. Why can't all the followers of the religion figure out it's a lie? Any thoughts on this religious cult? I have a lot of them, and you're, I'll tell you what, you've already said it. Ellen White had crazy visions. She had extra-biblical revelations, and the doctrines and the ideologies of the Seventh-day Adventists are not based upon the Scripture. They're not. They're not based upon the scripture. They're based upon the extra biblical revelations of Ellen White. If they were based on scripture, somebody asked me this question the other day and I didn't get to it. And the pastor Mike online, they were saying, oh my goodness, we're hearing that there's going to be a, nas a national Sunday law. Where is that book? I still have that in here somewhere. The national Sunday law. The national Sunday law is when the beast is going to make everybody go to church on Sunday. <laughs> That is, a, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of in my life. 
That the mark of the beast is everybody going to church on Sunday. But that's what Ellen White said. That's what the Seventh Day Adventist movement is pushing forward on everybody. And they're telling you that if you go to, if you walk in the door of a church on Sunday morning, you're going to hell. That is unbiblical. It's work salvation. And they don't even get the. They say, why don't you keep the fourth commandment? And I'll ask them, how come you don't keep the tenth? But they don't even get the fourth commandment right. They have this idea that the fourth commandment commands everybody to go to church on Saturday, and it doesn't. It says rest on Saturday. It says rest on the seventh day, and they don't see that. Them and all of these Hebrew roots people, and I'll tell you something. I am finding out. I'm finding out that I'm going to go to a conference in Dallas, Texas, with some people that are hooked into the Hebrew roots false gospel system, and I ain't backing up. I am not going to stand for someone promoting keeping the works of the law in order to retain salvation or to retain blessings or merits from God, or as if, if you're not following the works of the law, you're not a real Christian. I am not going to put up with that. I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm going to preach against it. You pray for me so that sometime between now and Dallas, Texas, I make a video, and we're going to have a 1,000 copies on the table out there to give to everybody. Because I, I, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to, I don't deal well with this. I don't, I have been in bondage before, people. I have been in it. Brady and Bradley, they've been in cult bondage. They have been in bondage. Um, I'm being told that Dave Hunt does not teach spiritual death of Christ. Let's look into it. All right. Before I retract the statement, let's get some evidence. So I'm going to put it out to you watchers out there. Dig it up and tell me what's yay or nay. All right? If he said it, I'm going to go against it. If he didn't say it, doesn't believe it, I'm going to apologize. Simple as that. All right? Is that fair enough to everybody? But I need evidence. I need statements. All right? Uh, but anyway, people that follow the Hebrew Roots Movement, I'm, I am... I am not going to let you get by with stealing lambs out of the flock of God. And that's what you're after. You're after lambs. You're after sheep in the flock of God who have been saved by grace alone and not by works, who have been saved by the, the terms and the conditions of the new covenant, which is not after the terms and the conditions of the old covenant. It's not. I even read one of the, what was that? Um, you know what? I have a picture of it. Hang on here. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to expose a wolf right now. Are you ready for this? Here we go. Drum roll, please. Where did, where did, I took a snapshot of a website on my guy pad. Here it is. 119 Ministries. 119 Ministries. 119 Ministries. Hebrew Roots. And they actually, they went so far as to change the reading in the New Testament because they didn't like what it said. And so you have to change the, and by the way, Hebrew roots people, by and large, hate the King James Bible. Oh, they say, oh, we use the King James. No, you don't. No, you don't. You change it. You augment it. You reform it. You retranslate it. You even say that it never was written in Greek to begin with and that it was skewed by these Gentile uh, pagans to make it sound like that we can, we can be saved by grace alone. And I'm not apologizing. And I'm not backing up. And if, and if whoever is out there in Dallas is, is promoting this Hebrew roots nonsense, I'm going to go unpromote it is what I'm going to do. Forrest, you got me all fired up and stirred up here, all right? Anywho, uh, somebody, SX Falls 1, says, can you give me scripture reference about Godhead not being represented by man's engraving? That's going to be real simple, okay? Graven. It's in the book of Acts. I can never remember places in the Bible. 
Acts 17, 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. There it is. Dickie Wayne, how you doing? Pastor Mike in Revelation 2, 9 and Revelation 3, 9, Jesus was talking to the angel of Ephesus and Sardis, respectively. How would these verses apply to modern times? Thank you, Dickie Wayne. Here's, here's a little little theory I have. Number one, I believe what it says. I believe that they were specifically addressed to these seven churches. However, the whole idea of the seven churches is interesting uh, because you, you and, and we covered this last night in our Bible study, in Wednesday night Bible study. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit, one, you know, all the, there's seven things there. We know that the church is full of the Holy Ghost and there are seven spirits of God. We know that Christ had the seven spirits of God. We know the menorah had seven candles on it and all of these issues. And so when I see the seven churches, I just, I see that they are indicative of church today. I think that you can look at all seven of those churches and I think that you can see them today. I think you can. And so um, the Bible says of itself, um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So if someone says, Dickie Wayne, if someone says, well, we really can't base what we believe on what God said or what Jesus said to Sardis because he said it to Sardis. He didn't say it. And there are people, I, I, believe it or not, there are people who will take that, that letter to Sardis. It's almost like they'll just take it out of the Bible and then they'll form their doctrines. And if something that Jesus said to the church in Sardis goes against their doctrine, they'll say, well, that's not, that's not for us. But the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. And, and what, I, what I truly believe is that if a doctrine is right and correct, then the whole of the Bible will match the doctrine, including letters to Sardis or Ephesus or Paul to the Hebrews or James to the 12 tribes or whatever. Peter, I know he was the apostle of the Jews. I just have this idea that if your doctrine is right, it will match the whole counsel of God. Here a little and there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. Didn't matter who it was written to. Isaiah, was he speaking only to Israel? Was he not speaking to us here? David, was he simply writing psalms uh, to the people of his day, or do they not have true and accurate meaning for us today? First and second Peter, be, Peter being the apostle to the Jews, was he not dealing with the brotherhood, the brethren? And what I'm, what I'm saying is, if somebody has a doctrine, a doctrinal idea or statement, and it doesn't match with the whole of the scripture, here's what in some cases they'll do. They'll say, well, that was written, <coughs> that was written to Israel and that doesn't apply to us. And so, I mean, it's still the Bible, but it's, we are, my doctrine's still intact because I took this out. I, I just, I can't see doing that. I don't have the Bible's permission to do that. And so I think Christ was addressing these churches specifically, but also that doctrine can and should be based at least in part on what Paul said to Ephesus and Sardis. I hope, and if that makes sense, and I hope that was the direction you wanted me to go in. Watcher Doyle in Niederland, he said, I need help, Pastor Mike. Uh, does 1 Corinthians 12, 3, King James Bible, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Can you clarify for me the difference between this verse in Galatians 3, 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. You know, that's interesting. A no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed but he was being made a curse for us i'm gonna have to dig on that watcher thanks a lot as if i didn't have enough to do 
Um, I'm going to reserve that. I know there cannot be a contradiction in the Bible. I know that. That's rule number one. Rule number one, there are no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if you think you found one, refer back to rule number one. Let that guide you as you study this thing out. And immediately I would, I would say just on the surface, there should be a difference between calling Jesus a curse and then him being made a curse for us. So, but I, I'm going to have to dig into this more. But I, that is a good question. It's, you stumped me. Okay. Anyway, uh, Tracy said, yesterday while praying during the Bible study, I believe that God had given me a word saying that the times are growing darker. So put on the full armor of God, submit and, and I, I, oh. I had a guy trying to tell me the Bible is full of uh, figures of speech. You don't really have an armor on you. You don't really have that. It's just figure. And I'm going, what in the world? Submit and seek me with your heart, soul, mind, strength. Seek, seek you the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll take care of you. Fear not, but only believe. This is certainly a comfort and warning of the things to come, but I believe that the light of Christ will shine even brighter as the days become even darker. And Tracy, the only way that I would agree with that is I see scripture here. I mean, I see scriptural ideas and things in that, and I, I believe that I believe that God gave you that. Okay. All right. Now, here is a clip from the radio transcript from the Brian call with Dave Hutt and Tom McMahon dated October 3rd, 2012. This is regarding did Jesus die spiritually on the cross? Tom said, or some would say that he had laid aside his divinity. Dave Hunt said, um, let's see here. Hang on here, please. Please say to look to look at Tuesday Skype. You know, okay. Well, anyway, here I'm going to read this, and then we'll. If I need to clarify it further next week, I'll do that. Dave, here's what Dave Hunt said. You cannot do that. The Bible says he laid aside his glory. He did not manifest his glory, and he said to the Father in John 17, "Glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was." But he could not lay aside his divinity. Now it is beyond my comprehension. I cannot understand it. But he must have tasted spiritual death. This is what Dave Hunt said. Dave Hunt said he must have tasted spiritual death. That's the point this person is making, and we're not talking about dying spiritually as Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, people like that would say that Jesus ended up in hell. Tom said, being tortured by demons, that's where he paid the, so we really have Satan to thank for applying enough torture to Jesus that our sins are, the penalty is paid, it's ridiculous blasphemous. So they're blaspheming the doctrine of Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, which I'm glad to hear. So this might clear up some misconceptions about to what, to what Tuesday's listener commented on Dave Hunt regarding Jesus dying spiritually. The question I have for Jesus to have paid the penalty for sin, which is eternal separation, Hebrews 2, 9, did he have to taste spiritual death? I don't, I, I'll be honest with you, and I, I would even, I would even disagree with Hunt. I don't see the scripture saying that Jesus tasted spiritual death. It doesn't say that. It simply says that he tasted death for every man. And you have to ask, what did he do on the cross? They put something, they, they put wormwood to his lips, the bitterness, and he tasted it. I mean, he acted it out on the cross. I don't, I don't see, and, and I thank you for helping to clear this up. I don't see that Dave Hunt is saying that Jesus died spiritually. I would need to see more if you're going to prove that he said that. But I would disagree with him even when he said he must have tasted spiritual death. I don't use ideas like, well, he should have or he would have or he must have. I just, I, I'm looking at scripture. If I can see a verse here that says Jesus tasted spiritual death or, or whatever, then I believe it. But if I don't see that clearly in the scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, I don't go along with it. And so hopefully we've cleared this up to some extent. Maybe Hunt doesn't believe that Jesus died spiritually. Maybe he doesn't. I hope he doesn't because I think he's done some good things out there. Um, the question I have on Dave Hunt is, what is, his, what, is how do, what does he believe about the scriptures? What does he believe about the King James Bible? What is his stand on that? That would be the question that I would have. And if anybody has any information on that, 
um, then I would be I would I would look forward to seeing it. All right. All right. Let's move on. Um, Andrea, hi, Pastor. Sometimes you refer to the time you were electrocuted and the impact on you spiritually. I haven't been a listener long enough to be familiar with the story of what happened to you. Can you tell the story again? Yeah, because it makes me cry every time. Um, six and a half years ago on April 1st, 2006, uh, on a Saturday, uh, I got up and was doing just sweetie pie stuff around the house. I was trying to make my wife happy. I like to make my wife happy. And I am not, I am not a gifted handyman. I can, I can paint pretty well. I've painted. I did drywall. I can do some stuff pretty good. Electrical and plumbing stuff, I just I don't do it. I don't do it at all now. Uh, but that morning I got up and I actually repaired on my own independently a, um, an electrical box in our living room. And I was, I mean, I was patting myself on the back, high-fiving myself and going, I can't wait till she comes home to see this. And then I th and I had a I had a coax cable running the the length of we live in a what's called a modular home. They brought it out on wheels, set it up, and took the wheels out, and we put a, an addition room on the back of it with a little crawl space. And I'm underneath the crawl space. I'm underneath the house, and I'm trying to get this coax cable loose. It's I pulled it and it wouldn't come loose. So I'm crawling under. I'm on my hands and knees on this kind of wet ground. And I didn't know that the electrical line running underneath the house had ruptured. Moisture got into it, and the, the aluminum in it boiled up, and it split open, and there was an electrical current in the ground where I was. And I didn't know that until I leaned forward, and this shoulder, I still have a scar this long, touched the metal frame underneath the house. At that point, the circuit now is closed. The electricity from the ground and the grounding of the house came together, the fusion of opposites in my body. The electricity is going up this hand through my shoulders, this is why I have problems, and out this shoulder. And immediately, I can't, I can't see. It looks like a tie-dye t-shirt in my eyes. That's what it looked like. And I hear a low rumble in my ears, but that's all I hear. I can't talk. I can't move. I can't see anything. And I'm not in pain, but I know I'm being electrocuted. That's obvious to me. And I'm, I'm trying desperately to move, I, I, to, to do something to break this thing. And it's not working. And even now, I mean, and don't feel bad for asking me because I, I don't mind telling my testimony. But even now, it's such a it was such a horrendous thing. I get I get sick to my stomach just thinking about it. But don't feel bad, okay? Because I'll get sick to my stomach for Jesus every day if it, if I have to. And about 30, 45 seconds something into this thing, I don't know how long, but it was, you know about that about that time, I realized I'm not breathing. I was just paralyzed completely. And as soon as it dawned on me that I wasn't breathing, I said, I'm, I'm fully conscious and fully alert. I said, Mike, you're going to die today. This is it. This is, how, this is how you die. You die all alone under your house and no one is here to help you. And you're fixing to die. You're fixing to go stand before Almighty God. And my mind was going back to things I'd said wrong, things I'd done wrong. And I've been saved most of my life. And in my mind, I'm saying, God, forgive me. God, have mercy on me. Please, God. And then I just waited to die. It was really weird because I, I realized that I had my right hand on um, an old landscaping timber, just a wooden beam. I thought somebody was trying to grab my hand, but it was just that timber. And so I'm just going, and I'm waiting to die. 
And um, just before I, I could tell that I was starting to lose consciousness, just before, I mean, right split second. And I said, here we go. And then I said, in my mind, because if I would have said it with my mouth, it would have, would have been like, rah, 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 rah. you know, that's what it sounded like. I remember thinking, I don't want to leave my wife and kids yet. Just like that, it let go. I mean, just like that. Boom. It let go. And I, I collapsed to the, to the ground. And I screamed my head off. Matthew, who was 10, was out in the front yard playing, and he heard me. And he went, his grandpa, who lives right in front of us, was at the front of his house. He went hollering for his grandpa. And it's funny because his grandpa was in the front of the house. Matthew's behind. And he hears Matthew, so he runs around to the back of the house. Matthew's running around to the front. And they chase each other around the house a couple times. And then they finally catch up with each other. And he said, Dad's hurt under the house. When it, when it first let me go, I could have pulled myself out from underneath the house, but I didn't know what I'd touch, and I wasn't, I wasn't going to do that again. And so by the time my father-in-law, Sterling, came around and I told him I'd just been electrocuted, I can't move. So he pulled the, he pulled the meter off the pole. That disconnected everything. Fire department come out. They sent about four or five guys under there with a backboard, put me on it pulled me out. They were all huffing and puffing. I was, I, you know, I'm trying to make fun you know, these guys. Why are you guys breathing so hard? You know? And um, they loaded me up in an ambulance and uh, took me down the road a little bit to uh, a, housing, a lake housing complex where a helicopter was waiting to take me to St. John's Mercy Hospital up in St. Louis. They, they have a burn unit there. And this lady was in that helicopter that I, the ambulance attendant couldn't start an IV. She said, well, I got this. And we got on that helicopter and she went, damn, in my arm and started the IV. And uh, that probably hurt worse than what I, what pain I was in right then. We get to the hospital in just a matter of a few minutes. I mean, it's like an hour to drive, but it's just a few minutes up there, the helicopter. And they do all the tests, look at me and everything like that. And they say, you're fine. You can go home. But the problem was they cut all my clothes off. So I didn't have any clothes. So the chaplain went and got a pair of sweats and a black T-shirt. So when I say been there, done that, got a T-shirt, I literally got a T-shirt out of this. And my wife had heard about it. She was shopping. Her and my mother-in-law and little Caleb all came up. And when she walked in that room, I started bawling. And I said, I almost left you. And... Um, that was on a Saturday, and, and I, for a week, I couldn't move. Every muscle in my body just was doing that at the rate of the electricity. And um, they, people were making the mistake, hospital people, nurses, you know, what happened? Well, how did you get for the, make the mistake of asking me how I got free? Because I'm a preacher. And I said, let me tell you how I, let me tell you how I'm free. And I told him about Jesus, and I told him, Jesus makes you free. That's what happened to me. And um, I, I thought that maybe God had, a, God had something else for me to do after that. That's why I'm here. I make mistakes. I don't, I don't say everything right. Not perfect. But I'm going to stand for the Bible and stand for the grace that makes us all free. Somebody say amen. It's good to be with you today. Glad you long suffered with me. And uh, you pray for us. We'll pray for you. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.